Hello, and thank you for listening to Critical Thinking is Required. You're about to listen to our fourth literature review. And as you can see, I've changed it from literature series to literature review because we're just going to be discussing the books. And the series, I'm going to try to keep it for, like, let's say I do American Revolution series, and then I'll add all these, all the podcasts and all the videos I make into that series. I just thought that'd be a better future way to handle certain situations. Uh, but we're going to talk about the American Sphinx, the character of Thomas Jefferson. And just to let everyone know before we begin, the reason I'm about to have like 20 to 30 American or um, of these literature reviews during the next few months. I've already created 16 PowerPoint p presentations, and I have at least another 16 more because I'm getting rid of my library, and this is the best way to do it. And all these literature reviews are based on highlights that I've made when I read the book a few years ago. So I haven't reread the book like I did with some of the more recent literature reviews. This is just what I did before. I'm reviewing it by looking at all my highlights, which I love to highlight, so it's a lot of stuff. And then I'm condensing the information, mostly just facts, so I can follow the law and stuff. And it's just, just providing some information that maybe you didn't think about or maybe you didn't know. And it's all free, and you can check everything out. It's criticalthinkingisrequired.com. And so you're going to see this stuff peri periodically up here. And so hopefully you enjoy it. But today we're going to talk about basically Thomas Jefferson. And so let's begin. And so we're going to talk briefly about his early years. So this is when, his, when he's young, right? And he can be changed. Um, so the young Jefferson, well, as a young child, he learned Latin and Greek. He went to the College of William and Mary at age 17, which is a bit different than our age 18 today. And he actually, he was a very hard worker, I suppose. And he was very, he wanted to learn everything. Uh, and it sounds just like me and, and probably like a lot of you people who are listening, spending a lot of time educating himself. And um, he spent, for example, he spent 15 hours with his books every day, according to some people, and even three hours with his violin. So he didn't get a lot of sleep. He was a night guy. And he, he played music, and he read a whole lot. And he also inherited land from his father, which we'll learn a little bit more as well. Now, some of his early politics, you know, in his 20s, he well, he took the seat in the House of Burgesses at age 26. So this is sort of like the, um, the House of Representatives of the time. And so he was only 26 years old, and he was in a very, you know, important position. Um, and there, while he was there, he opposed parliamentary taxation. He was against that stuff, you know, you know, no taxation without representation, all this stuff. He did not like taxation. But he also supported non-importation resolutions against Britain. And so basically he said, you know, so it's really interesting to try to understand Thomas Jefferson because you, you tend to think of him, or at least when I hear about him, it's sort of like he's a libertarian, I guess, or that he's this... Cons and, and I guess that's a problem with libertarianism because you often hear these these comparisons to people who are conservatives or Republicans like Reagan and stuff. And these people are clearly not libertarians and neither was Thomas Jefferson. And so, yes, he may have opposed some taxation, just like some Democrats and Republicans do today, but he also supported big government in areas where many libertarians would disagree. So for example, during that time, there was sort of a, I don't know, like kind of a war, I suppose. And, and there actually was a war between Britain and uh, the United States, right? And so there was this problem. And so what happened was the, these, the Congress or, you know, whatever the House was at that time, right, it kept arguing, hey, we need to let's stop importation of various items from Britain into the United States. Right. So he actually supported these resolutions. And but but he was also hypocritical, just like many politicians are today, where he violated this on his own. So he said he told the people, and he said, you know, the government shouldn't allow these items to come from Great Britain, but at the same time, he actually ordered items from Great Britain to go in his house. And so two examples are he imported a piano and windows. So he wanted this stuff because he was very, um, he, he liked a nice house. He liked nice things in his house. And it was one of his vices, I suppose. And he, it went so much that he actually violated his, his kind of rule, at least imposed upon others. Now, the new ruling class actually supported this non-importation resolution because they had the supply to meet demand. So, like, let's, let's think about that as well. There were, it wasn't just hypocr hypocrisy from his, his end because he wanted certain items, but it was also a scheme that was used by some people, just like politicians do today, to get money, um, you know, to get money. Because, because, hey, if you can't import these things from Britain, well, now you're going to have to import it from somewhere. And guess what? I'm a politician. I own a lot of land. I own some businesses. We're going to produce and we're going to meet that demand. He 
He was also a very excellent writer, as he's written a lot of famous documents, but he wasn't a very good speaker, and there were, there were very few politicians who were like that. I mean, think about it today where it's, it's sort of the opposite. You have to be a good speaker and not a good writer. Now, he wrote, he drafted the Declaration of Independence, but the way he viewed that is that it wasn't really a big deal. It wasn't like he was doing something that was honorful or patriotic or anything like that. It was just him just drafting this thing that he may not have believed in but kind of did. Um, but he did think it was an, sort of important, at least in the main the main points that it was making. But as far as drafting it, he didn't think he was a hero. And then there were some deletions of when he you know, drafted it and he added things into it, but they were eventually de- deleted and taken out by Congress at the time in the United States. And so there's, there's three examples of, of things that Congress deleted from uh, from Jefferson's drafting of the Declaration of Independence. And so one is, well, he blamed George III, which is the leader of Great Britain at the time, or the king, for waging, quote, cruel war against human nature itself by establishing slavery. So he wanted to take the stand against slavery, but Congress said, hey, it's kind of a sticky issue. We're not going to do it. Um, the first set, another one is the first settlers came, quote, unassisted by the wealth or the strength of Great Britain. So to me, that was kind of making it look like, you know, here we have these freedom guys who just love freedom and they're coming out here and they didn't have to use Great Britain. We didn't need their assistance. We did this all on our own. So I think that was more of a, just a, a kind of stance that he felt was important. And the third one is, quote, our British brethren sent not only soldiers of our common blood, but Scotch and foreign mercenaries to invade and destroy us. So again, he, and you, you, you'll see this in maybe future literature reviews that we do regarding the Constitution of the United States and how one of the problems was a standing army, and that was one of the worries. Well, he, he, that's kind of what Britain did, and that's why it was a worry, because Britain had actually done this. So not only did they use soldiers that were themselves British or Americans or whatever, but that they also used mercenaries to come in and invade and, and kind of you know take property of people in the United States. And some simple quotes of things that he said that I thought were important, uh, th- random things that he wrote from time to time, is that one, he had, quote, an infallible rule for deciding what that nation England would do on every occasion to consider what they ought to do and to take the reverse of that as they would assuredly do. So what, do you, and what I like about this quote, and I'll say it again just to make sure you understand, but it, it reminds me of today, okay? <laughs> Let's think about it again. So he's talking about, you know, England and what they're doing. Well, they have they have this infallible rule for deciding what that nation, England, would do on every occasion. So here's the rule that would always happen. To, quote, to consider what they ought to do and to take the reverse of that as they would assuredly do. So basically, you know, we, we look today and we say, you know, what government says, this is what we should do, right? And but what we should do as people is whatever they say we should do, we should just do the opposite, because that's probably what we should be doing. <laughs> and, and not only that, but they're going to do what they say they're going to do. And then another quote that he said was, quote, I am not a federalist because I never submitted the whole system of my opinions to the creed of any party of men, whatever. Such an addiction is the last degradation of a free and moral agent. If I could not go to heaven, but with a party, I would not go there at all, end quote. And so he was against the political system, as many of the people were at the time, though they actually participated in it. And not only did they participate in it, which can be bad or good, but they actually con- they made it worse. You know, they contributed to the, the conflicts that occurred at the time. Because, again, it may be hard to believe, but this, this partisan non, you know, partisanship that we have today, it's not new. It's happened decade after decade, and it even happened in the beginning even after George Washington was, and even while George Washington was president. Um, so he's just saying, you know, he's not this federalist. Uh, we should be, it should be the issues rather than uh, the party. Um, but he was also bad with money. So this is one of the things I was thinking about with um, trying to think of hypocrisy today and trying to understand, you know, h- how can you be someone who supports fiscal responsibility or fiscal conservativeship or, you know, spending money wisely as government if you yourself don't spend money wisely. And you could blame, you could say, you know, why, how, are, how are you going to be a politician and lead us if you're $30,000 in debt? Like, how, how do you have the moral, well, you know, it's an interesting one, but how do you have this credibility of saying that? And it, it, it's a good point. Like, do you? And you can blame the situation of the country, but couldn't you do the same thing once you're in charge? Or is it just something different because all your, and this is the way I look at it, is that you're just viewing it as a politician. You're just, you're viewing it as a different, it's a whole different 
it's a whole different situation than your personal financial situation because as a government agent, you are now responsible for so many people and not just yourself, which could be a bad or good thing as well because theoretically you should be acting in your best self-interest. But, but then again, if, if it's up to you and you're voting, it's only you who gets to make that choice, whereas maybe if you have personal problems that maybe it's because you have children or because you're married or because you have family and you all decide things together and that can be difficult. But at the same time, you can make that decision and say, no, I can't spend. As a politician, you have a little bit more, I think, freedom actually to say, no, I'm not going to spend money. Although people might view that differently. And I think reasonably, um, but he was bad with money. He retired as the secretary of state. He owed about 4,500 pounds to English creditors and another 2000 pounds to others. So quite a bit of money. Most of that, the money that he did have was from the inheritance of land from his father-in-law. But some of the problems that, you know, the reason, you know, he had these money situations, uh, he, he would blame inflation, which again is not a new problem. It's, it's always been a problem. Um, and he also loved books, furnishings, and wines. So like I said earlier, he, he loved having his book, his house filled with stuff, just like many people today. He was several hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, but it was normal for the time and his class. He was also a landowner. Like I said, um, he owned over 11,000 acres. So that's something to think about. Something to think about, too, when you look at his self-interest, when he drafts these laws, just like the fact that he owned slaves. Um, you got to think about that. that. Yeah, it's nice that you can say something, but if you don't actually do something, then what, what's the what's the point there? Um, but he owned over 11,000 acres. They weren't very well planned out. It was kind of like sporadic lands here and there. So it's not like he could, he couldn't really be a big farmer and make a lot of money because at least not compared to other people at the time in his class, because of the way the land was kind of planned out. Okay. It also lacked nutrients that were necessary for crops. So it wasn't the best sort of land to actually make crops and to make money off of it more importantly. And he often left management to others. So he'd rather read and write rather than actually managing. He wasn't one of those awesome people who would actually work the fields and do things like that. That wasn't really him. He also owned slaves. He disposed of 161 slaves by sale or by gift from 1784 to 1794, but he had a natural increase to raise the total to 167 after this period. So, you know, they're having babies and all that stuff, or they're getting a relationship, whatever. And so, yeah, he disposed of a lot of slaves, but he also increased the total to 167. So even as he was uh, vice president, he owned slaves. So something to think about, too. And, and thinking about hypocrisy, credibility, and just culture, and being able to fight culture, and what you think is important. So slavery, he gave specific instructions that particular slaves should not be sold or hired out unless consented. We're going to be talking about George Washington in another review, and he, he was kind of the similar way where they, they, they did care about their slaves in a certain aspect. They kind of, to me, I keep thinking of it, and as I've read a lot of these books recently, like reread because of through all the highlights, it's, it's kind of like the way I look at how they viewed slaves is they viewed them as children. They viewed them as property. I mean, that's, that's how people view children, even today. Even some libertarians, right, they believe in guardianship. Well, guardianship is basically property. It's basically treating these people as property and because they're too dumb or they're not smart enough or they're not equal to us to make these decisions on their own, right? So you can say they're children, and you can give whatever you know excuse you want to, but regardless, you have some sort of guardianship, and it's the same thing over slavery. Um, and neither of them consent to the, the, the situation of the guardianship. Neither does someone in a maybe who's mentally retarded or whatever the politically correct term is. You know, these are all various different degrees. Um, and in whippings and all that stuff, kids were whipped too. So it's like, I don't know, but it's a bad situation, right? And he gave specific instructions that said, hey, I like this guy. I don't want him to, to be sold or hired out or go anywhere else unless they actually consent. The slave himself. Right. So here's here's a horrible slave owner. Right. He said, I want to be able to I want him to be able to consent or her. Um, there was no evidence of beating from Thomas Jefferson and, and from a lot of slave owners, mind you, uh, it, it, in contrast to what we we believe that it didn't happen all the time, although when it did happen, it was often bad. Uh, just like a lot of stuff today, but overseers rarely did um, that type of beating under the 167 slaves that Thomas Jefferson old, owned at that time and throughout his life. Um, his, his general policy was much like many people because you want to make money. 
right? It's all about money. It's not about anything else for most people. And the policy was to sell off the troublemakers. So the people who kind of were rambunctious, didn't follow the rules, didn't play, well, you know, we're going to sell you off. What else are we going to do? We can whip you so much, you know? Like, what's the point of whipping you if it's not going to do anything? And he often followed the wishes of slaves who wanted to be sold to unite with family. So if a slave worked hard and did what he, was, you know, what he was doing or whatever, or what he was supposed to at the time, right? Well, then Thomas Jefferson would say, hey, we're going to sell you, and we're going to allow you to go with, uh, meet your family. And so now we're going to talk about president. So this is his time as the president of the United States. Well, he actually, this is an interesting fact. He delivered only two public speeches as president. So in contrast to today, and even George Washington and John Adams, you know, before him, he he was not a, a big t oralist. Okay, he he was he was a writer. He wasn't a speaker, and and it was it wasn't really necessary, I guess, for him. And so there are a couple of situations he had while president that suggest to me personally, and I think to most of us, that he's not a libertarian. Though you could argue for a libertarian position in some of these aspects, maybe, maybe not. Um, but I, I think they're important to look at to just show how whether how difficult it is to be president and withhold to certain principles or to just show that he wasn't a libertarian. And so there were the Barbary pirates, right? This was a really big situation at the time. And so two months after his inauguration, Barbary pirates on North African coast declared war on the United States. And the leader of that was so mad that the tribute he was receiving, so we were paying, the government was paying these pirates to not to not um, basically to not destroy or attack commercial boats that were going through the area. Okay, so we paid them, but we weren't paying them as much as we were paying to the Algiers. So this this different type of pirates and group. Okay, and so this guy was mad. So it reminds me of like uh, all the foreign policy that we have, where we're giving foreign aid to some countries and a little bit less to others. You could kind of see why some people would be upset that they're not getting aid, and and you could also see it from the people, you know, within the confines of that government complaint. Like, why am I not getting help? Why am I not getting assistance, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so he was mad, and he declared war. And so the response by Thomas Jefferson, well, he ordered a naval squadron to patrol the North African coast. So now they sent naval ships overseas and to, to kind of patrol the coast and attack anyone that was in the way. And this was interesting because as earlier, while John Adams was president, Thomas Jefferson actually opposed the buildup of the U.S. Navy. Again, he, he worried about the standing army thing, and he complained about it. But then once he was president, he's like, "Yeah, this is cool. And then he actually used them overseas, even though he didn't have to. This is something that could have been left up to the private market, right? They could have figured out some way. And not only just that, but they could have probably prevented this situation had they not been giving money to the Algiers and to other people in that area. Again, you leave it up to the, the private entities. And if they can't solve it, well, then you just, to me, it just, you have more economics here in the United States, right? Uh, but, but I think they would solve it. They would, they would probably find some way to say, hey, we're going to pay you a certain money to protect our thing. Or they're going to hire out some mercenaries or someone to protect their own boats. And the cost is going to be on them rather than everyone in the United States, right? And so, again, we see kind of the hypocrisy where he opposed the buildup, but then it, you know, he used it. And then another thing was the Louisiana Purchase. This was kind of a really interesting one as well. Uh, whether good or bad, and he thought it actually needed a constitutional amendment. Um, he, you know, at first he kept making these political arguments or rhetoric or whatever you want to say that we need a constitutional amendment, the people must vote, the states, more importantly, must vote and say, hey, if we're going to do Louisiana Purchase, because it's not really, I don't have the power as the president to do this, um, we need a constitutional amendment because it's not really in the Constitution to say that they can do this. And he said, quote, it would be desirable for Congress to do what is necessary in silence. Now, Congress, so that, that's eventually, you know, he said it needed a constitutional amendment, but then he said, hey, let's just have Congress do this. And yeah, it's not really constitutional, but as long as they're silent about it, they don't talk about it too much, fine. And again, that's scary stuff because once you say that, then you can then apply that kind of logic or reasoning to everything else that Congress could potentially do, which is kind of scary. And Congress eventually ratified this purchase and passed legislation giving broad power to the president to oversee it. And he, as president, actually appointed a governor over the territory, even though he complained of such conduct when Adams was president. So he, he wanted things—he he was worried about kings, just like many people at the time were. 
and he didn't want one person to be in charge of a chariot. He liked kind of legislators being involved. He didn't really like the people being involved either. So he didn't like the kings. He didn't, you know, he didn't like the uh, uh, parliament. You know, he didn't like the, the monarchy is what I'm thinking. And he didn't like democracy. He kind of liked the republic idea. You know, you have these legislators who are in charge. And unfortunately, when he had the power to do this stuff, he didn't, you know, he was a bit hypo- hypocr- hypocritical. And then there was also a free speech issue where he supported it in theory, but because there were so many, so many issues, um, you know, newspapers multiplied. There were there were a lot of newspapers at the time. A lot of people read, and they often ran with scandals. So just like today, you know, whether it be Bill Clinton having sex with Monica Lewinsky or something, maybe a suit that Obama's wearing wrong or a wrong uh, hand salute with a dog or a coffee cup or whatever. Uh, the newspapers like that stuff. And what he believed is, quote, that this is a dangerous state of things and the press ought to be restored to its credibility if possible. Right? Now, and the reason I'm saying this is because there was the Sedition Act at the time, which he didn't pass. Um, He didn't sign it. I think it was John Adams. But he also, and he was, he also used it, though. But instead of doing it more broadly, like like, uh, what John Adams would do and say, hey, you know, all these newspapers, we're not going to let them, or all, uh, let's say, all anarchists, and this is, this is a lot, you know, I'm not being truthful here, but, but he would group it like that, right? All these Republican, all these Federalist papers we're going to punish, all these Anti-Federalist papers we're going to punish. Whereas Thomas Jefferson said, okay, we can do that, but I'd rather it be more specifically, let's just say, not all Anti-Federalists are all Federalists, but just a couple here and there, right? And that's kind of what he wanted to do and what he actually did and applied as president. And so some of the themes, I guess, of this literature review as we close up here, the short review, is basically hypocrisy, right? So it's something I've really been thinking about lately and just, you know, whether it's, I've been really deeply thinking about whether it's an actual character attack. And so I ask you to do the same thing. You know, if, if you, like like Thomas Jefferson, if you were against these if you're against presidential power and all this stuff, but then you do these non-importation resolutions, you know, the Barbary Pirates situation where you're, you're, against, you're against the use of the Navy, but then you use the Navy. If you're against the Louisiana Purchase, so the idea that there should be a governor in charge or that, um, you know, if there's not a specific power in the Constitution, they shouldn't be able to use it, but then you actually do that stuff. Or with free speech, same thing, where he, he's sort of hypocritical. You know, what is that? Is that it? Should you attack the person? Is that a character attack or is that just hypocrisy? Like, is it, e- is it even important? Or do you just look at each issue specifically and just say, well, the non importation don't make sense, f- doesn't make sense for these two reasons or whatever. So it's just something I've been thinking about, especially when you see politician. You know, I've been listening to like Rush Limbaugh. Uh, uh, I listen to him maybe once a month and I listened to the other day and he was making these complaints. I forgot what it was about Obama. And I just kept, it just sounded really, really cheap. Like, why, one, why are we talking about this? And two, like, like uh, the same thing happened at Bush. But then, you know, and I've done this. I've been guilty of this. And so, again, I'm thinking about this stuff. Is that It's kind of cool to, to make that point that that person did the same. But that doesn't mean that you can do it then, right? So you can't say, oh, well, Bush would have done this or about uh, Reagan would have done this. But then, like, I, I don't know. I've just been thinking about it. And it's like, you know, like you have, you're a kid and you say, well, he did it. Well, fine, but that doesn't allow you to do it, even though if you did it, it would be equal to what he's doing, right? But it's still bad, so you shouldn't be doing it, right? That, that should be your ultimate goal. Again, we're not perfect, okay? So we're, there's going to be times where we actually are like a kid or, or a human being or whatever you want to say, and we are going to act the same way they did, and I think that's okay. But as long as you try not to do it, right? And especially when you're in government, it's a whole different thing, right? Because you actually control, quote, unquote, in quotes, people, I mean, you do in a way you you affect people's lives, and so it's it's a really big position. And then the other theme I think is history repeats itself. So you can clearly see I think a lot of these issues, the things that were going on then, could be going on today. So complaints about Britain that he had, and you know those three main complaints that he made in the Declaration that were deleted, those were kind of things that we could be complaining about now. Minus slavery, though, you could sort of make an argument for some slavery, especially if you think taxes is slavery. Or, or at least in some sense that it's slavery, right? Or being at war. Just think of the idea of us constantly being at war. Does that make us slaves? And, and again, I'm not, 
I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking critically here. I, I don't really know, but there's different things like that. But, but even beyond that, history repeats itself in the sense that we have a king just like they had a king back then, and they were scared of that king. We were scared of the king. We still have a king, right? And then the foreign policy interventions and then even domestic interventions, which you can make today similarly. But that's today's review. Thank you for listening. Make sure you check out criticalthinkingsrequired.com, and thank you for listening.